and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests are Nicholson Price, Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School, and Jonathan I. Teets, a recent graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. We will discuss their article, Acknowledgements as a Window into Legal Academia, which will be published in the Washington University Law Review. So, Nicholson, Jonathan, Welcome to the show. Thanks. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Yes. Uh, thanks, Brian. Yeah. Well, I am delighted to have you on. I absolutely adore this paper, and I've adored it before it was even written because I remember when you sent around the uh, the surveys that you did in preparation for the paper. And I was like, something really interesting is definitely going to come out of this. And I was not, I was not disappointed. Um, but before we get into the substance of the paper itself, I wonder if Nicholson, Jonathan, you could just talk a little bit sort of initially about sort of what legal scholarship is like and what the landscape of legal scholarship looks like from both the perspective of professors submitting legal scholarship and also from the perspective of students and specifically student law review editors sort of involved in kind of evaluating and publishing legal scholarship. Sure. So legal scholarship is, is deeply, deeply strange. Uh, and I say that as someone who, like Jonathan, uh, kind of grew up academically in the natural sciences. Um, often when I talk to people about how legal scholarship works, they're, they're kind of taken aback and don't really believe that this is the model of publication. So, you know, instead of having peer-reviewed submissions where you'll take an article and you submit it to one journal and you wait for peers to review it, and then eventually you hear back and see what happens uh, in legal scholarship there is uh, no formal process of peer review and there are these parallel submissions where you'll submit to 40 or 50 or 100 different law reviews all at the same time uh, which are run by student editors and you're you're in this race uh, to see who's going to accept the article and if somebody accepts the article can you then trade up to a fancier journal by saying hey, this less, less fancy journal accepted my article. You should totally accept it because obviously it's awesome. Uh, it's, it's a deeply bizarre process. Um, I think it's got its, it's got its benefits, but it's very strange. Yes, yeah, so my first introduction to legal scholarship was um, second semester pretty much of, of law school when I actually started to RA for, for Nicholson. Um, and it struck me just as completely bizarre um, coming from just having been fresh from a, from a chemistry PhD program and having been involved with publishing and reviewing articles there. Um, just looking at, well, first thing was that law articles have no pictures in them. Um, and that struck me as very strange because, um, you know, this, this whole field was based around um, a very formulaic, very text heavy medium. But then again, or then the other thing too, um, was this bizarre review structure um, in that you have people with ostensibly no expertise um, for all intents and purposes reviewing in contrast to in the sciences where even though a good, a good substantial portion of review, review doesn't occur by professors, it occurs by professors, grad students in all honesty, those grad students um, are still specialists in their work and have often worked very, very similar to subject matter that's described in the paper. The other thing that I found really strange about legal scholarship that I think no one realizes is that you have the same editors doing format editing and format of citations, as well as substance editing and looking at truth of statements, fact checking, and, and all of that. That struck me as very strange because in most editing in peer reviewed articles, you essentially see substance edited by subject matter experts, and then you have trained editors doing the editing. And then the other thing being the criteria for authorship, 
in in science, you know, you you run a couple assays, and often doing that is enough for authorship, or simply being the person running the lab um, is enough. Whereas in law, you can contribute a lot to an article and still be acknowledged, or depending on uh, the particular uh, idiosyncrasies idiosyncrasies of the professor, you might not be acknowledged at all. It's a structurally just this bizarre, um, bizarre sui generis endeavor. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, the kind of standard story is that legal scholarship doesn't have the kinds of checks and balances or oversight that would be provided by peer review in other disciplines. And I thought one of the really interesting things about your article, which, you know, wasn't unique to your article, but I think you really did an interesting and novel job of investigating, was that maybe there are kind of alternative forms of oversight that are kind of unique to legal scholarship that accomplish at least some of the same goals. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of what the differences in the sort of atmosphere of law scholarship as opposed to scholarship in other fields are, how that might work, and sort of what you look to to identify how that kind of oversight might take place. Sure. I mean, one one thing I'll say is that I think people, especially people who have not done laboratory science, vastly overestimate how useful peer review is as a method of actually honing results and uh, distilling down ideas and removing problematic aspects of, of science. Um, so I, I kind of went into this as a peer review skeptic in the first place. And there's also this strangeness in, in science where often discussion and vetting of papers before publication is sort of frowned upon um, because there's this emphasis on being the first and not being scooped and all of that. Um, at the same time, you have all these informal discussions and presentations at conferences and, and presentations in laboratory group meetings and such. And those serve really often more than reviewer comments do to hone the paper and point out areas of weakness and suggest areas of change. And, you know, in legal academia, we, we notice that you have a lot of those same things present in that you'll have faculty workshops and presentations there and um, conversations between RAs and professors or between professors and preprint submission and uh, conversations on, uh, based on preprints on SSRN and the like. Yeah, the other thing that I'll add in, and this, this frankly isn't something that came within the paper, but in terms of kind of a quality check, right, it, there's a, a law review articles get a lot of uh, knocks for having just absolutely excessive numbers of footnotes and just the idea that basically every sentence has to have some sort of support for it. And, you know, that's, that's another strangeness of legal scholarship, although, again, not when we probe in the paper. But part of the purpose of that, I think, is serving as its own type of kind of, you know, knowledge authority, rather than saying, hey, look, I'm a super duper expert in this and super duper experts in this have gone through a formal peer review process and said it's right. You say, okay, you know, I'm a smart person who knows what they're doing. And also, every single thing I've said in this is backed up by at least some sort of authority. It's, it's a different way of trying to say, you should believe what I write in this paper. It's got its flaws, um, as does kind of the, the scientific process or does the process of scientific publishing. But it is a way of trying to say, no, no, here's why you should believe what I said. Well, so, so a big part of the paper is really trying to dig into what this sort of shadow peer review process, as it were, actually looks like in the context of legal scholarship and sort of trying to figure out how it works in practice. And you have a really clever way of doing it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the methodology, what you look to, why you look to it, and sort of why you think that this is an effective way 
of providing a window on to how sort of the internal sort of uh, peer relationships and legal scholarship work. Yeah. So the uh, so the basic idea here is that we wanted to look at the star footnotes uh, in law review articles, which is to say the the acknowledgement footnote or the biographical footnote or that that dagger footnote. People call it different things. The first thing at the beginning of the article at the bottom of the page that says, you know. I am professor of law at blah, 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 and my thanks to X, Y, Z, and whoever else uh, for their useful thoughts and comments. Uh, and so we thought this actually would be a, a really interesting place to do a quantitative study to figure out, well, who does get thanked? And how often do people get thanked? And what do they get thanked for? And how does that relate to other things that we might find interesting about articles and how might we probe that to figure out kind of relationships in the legal academy and how these scholarly communities come together? Uh, and so that's a big part of the of the paper and the analysis that we did. Uh, and the other half of this was just to see, you know, when we ask people uh, whether they're authors or they're editors, uh, how do you think about those those footnotes? How do you think about the process of using this kind of informal peer review and what role does it play in the publication process? What do they say? Uh, and so for that, we did a, a qualitative survey where we had an indisputably uh, convenient sample, which is to say it's not random at all. It's not representative at all. It's just people that answered our Twitter and Facebook and email survey requests. Um, and people said, you know, here's how I write this, or here's how, as a law review editor, uh, I read these footnotes and, and what I use them for. And so maybe talk a little bit more about the study. Like, what kinds of questions did you actually ask? What did you look to? And what ultimately did you find about, you know, what we can learn from these acknowledgement footnotes? Yeah, so one thing we did um, was just download a ton of law review articles. Um, which is a little bit of a Zen exercise in itself. But we took everything from 2008 to 2017 and basically most generalist law reviews at U.S. law schools. And that gave us about 29,000 articles. And then we applied, just essentially used um, scripting and natural language processing um, to extract information from those footnotes um, and basically throw them into a database. And so we would extract, um, you know, length of a footnote, how many sentences there would be, how many people appeared in the footnote based on um, program predictions of, of what names looked like. And from, from that, and we were able to basically probe, okay, well, what kind of language do people use in footnotes, right? And how many people and when do they talk about people and how and um, how many institutions do they thank, et cetera. And so doing that, then we were able to basically interrogate very specific questions. You know, and one of the most one of the most obvious ones to look at was, is there a difference in how long footnotes are? Um, you know, there's there's no objective reason that a footnote in a particular journal should be longer than another. But the star footnotes in the top 50 ranked journals um, show a sharp increase. And likewise, there's more complexity in those footnotes and especially number of people thanked. And, um, and so that was interesting. One of the particular interesting things that I think popped up was that, you know, certain words appear with certain patterns across the spectrum of law review fanciness. You have some words that appear with the same frequency at all ranks of journals, and professor is one of those, right? And, and that makes sense because that'll be in the byline of most authors. For words like research, as in this work benefited from help from research assistants, or thanks for research assistant to so-and-so, you actually see a linear increase. And that kind of makes sense too, in that if you believed in a merit meritocratic world, you would expect that more heavily researched articles or articles receiving more research assistance might place better. 
But then what you see is this weird hockey stick effect where for certain terms, they're very heavily weighted toward top ranked journals. And one of those is workshop. And so I thought that was one of the more um, surprising things, um, but that might be surprising from a position of um, being naive. I mean, do you think that we can draw sort of explanatory or causal inferences from any of the observations you made about this empirical study of of acknowledgement footnotes? Like, you know, does this tell us anything about how journals make decisions? And if so, are there aspects of that that we should be cautious about or concerned about? Yeah, I think so. So, so I, just worth pointing out that you know there are lots of things we can do with this data, these data, and, and hopefully we're going to do more things with these data. But kind of the the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit was, especially since law professors are obsessed with the fanciness of the journals they're placed. Except I note uh, you, Brian, uh, who are a delightful exception to that rule. Um, but uh, law professors in general are like, I have to place in the fanciest place possible, and we see these really strong relationships. Um, so I think the one, the very easiest conclusion we can come to is there's not no relationship, right? One possibility is, you know, this sort of informal vetting, this sort of informal peer review, it's taking things out of workshops, all of that kind of stuff, or at least reporting it, doesn't have any relationship at all to where a journal ends up. And we see that that's, that's definitely not true. Now, there are a number of possible explanations for why we might see a relationship, right? The, there are some that we really can't test well at all. Like maybe really brilliant people get invited to present their work at lots of really great workshops and also write really great work that gets published in really great law reviews. That's totally possible. And that would be quite hard for us to, to tease out from our data. Um, but when we try to look at the the causal story, I think we, we saw at least two rationales that we thought were plausible and then then were backed up when we asked people what they thought about it and how they how they wrote these things and how they used uh, the, the acknowledgments footnotes in the law review selection process. And the two rationales are first, you know, maybe these things actually do help quality, which is to say if you run it by a lot of people and a lot of people read your draft and give you comments and you presented a lot of workshops, that makes the article better. Right? That's a hopeful story. We would like for that to happen. Uh, and then the betterness, ideally, we would hope, uh, also gets reflected in in kind of where where journal where uh, pieces end up. The other potential explanation, or at least another big potential explanation, was that these are basically signals, which is to say, if law review editors are either not great at identifying quality or are rushed and need kind of heuristics to help them identify quality uh, in an article, then one way to look at quality is to look at the star footnote and say, hey, a lot of people have read this. And maybe some of the people that have read this are fancy people that I recognize that teach at fancy schools. And okay, if they think this article is good, then it's probably good. And, and I should at least bump it up to the next stage of review or something like that. And so... It's hard to tease these two things out just with the, the data, although we, we try to do that a little bit by looking at some articles that get prizes, and we see that some of the relationships still hold particles that get prizes. But then when we asked people, you know, what do you, what do you think about when you write a review? And what do you think about, oh, sorry, what do you think about when you write an acknowledgments footnote? And what do you think about when you read an acknowledgments footnote as a student editor? We actually see support for both of these theories. We see student editors saying, um, yeah, I read this as a proxy for quality. If I see names that I know, that's a good sign. And if I don't see names of anybody, um, that's a sign that maybe the article is half-baked. Uh, and at least some of the authors in our sample said rather explicitly, you know, I write acknowledgment footnotes with an eye to student editors. Uh, and if there's somebody famous that has even glanced at this paper, I will put them in the acknowledged footnotes footnote so that students will see that this fancy famous person has read the piece uh, and might might think more highly of it because of that. I mean, I think one thing that's uh, kind of a concern, right, is that there's what we've, what we've found is there's a widespread diversity in what editors understand inclusion footnotes to mean or what they expect it to mean, and also widespread diversity in how people construct those footnotes. 
So to the extent that looking to the content of a biographical footnote and looking to the, the indicia of vetting or an author's network is useful as a heuristic, especially um, for editors who, who need the help of heuristics, there's a concern because certain people are going to be able to play the game better than others. And if certain people don't even know that these factors might be at play, um, that serves basically to reinforce existing inequalities in um, academic opportunity. I mean, I, I got to say, you know, the description that you provide makes it really sound like, you know, these acknowledgement footnotes are sort of reinforcing already existing hierarchies. I mean, after all, the kinds of people who have access to fancy commenters and fancy workshops and are able to put those into their footnotes are just going to be signaling more and more quality by virtue of, of doing that. Are there reasons you think to be concerned that A, you know, this isn't such a great heuristic and B, that it might be an inequitable heuristic? I think it's definitely inequitable. I mean, I think it's inequitable for two different reasons, one of which you, you point to, which is to say, you know, um, if it turns out that I can write to you know, some fancy professors and say, hey, will you take a look at my piece? And they say, yes, because they know me. Like, that's a that's a leg up that I have. And if that ends up um, being a, a signal that law review editors have, that's, that's a leg up that I have over other people. Um, to be fair, it's also the case that if I can write to fancy people and they'll read my article, hopefully they'll help me make it better. Uh, and, and that would be... Uh, a justifiable leg up, assuming that what we're looking for is kind of selection of quality things. So I think that's that's one type of of uh, of potential kind of inequality reinforcement going on here. The other one really is just based on knowledge, which is to say, you know, I I was told in my fellowship and at other times, like being trained to be a legal academic, hey, you want to acknowledge anybody that's looked at this piece, you want to name them in the star food. And I even received the advice once, you should name everybody and the school at which they teach. Because if you list Harvard and Yale and Stanford a bunch of times in your acknowledgments footnotes, that's going to be great. Um, and that's advice that I got because I was really like, lucky and privileged in my path to academia. And I think that's knowledge and advice that a lot of people don't necessarily get. Uh, so in as much as there's a knowledge gap uh, that's likely to create kind of uh, an enforcement and status uh, status and hierarchy reinforcement here, um, that frankly is something where I think the paper might actually be its own intervention. You know, if we can just share the fact that, hey, uh, it turns out this is a signal that people send and a signal that people get, um, that knowledge itself, I think, is, is a, a useful thing to share and part of what I hope uh, comes out of this project. I mean, there's two there's there's uh, two possible interventions I can think of, right? I mean, I suppose there's more, but one would be one that's been floated around, and um, a couple of journals are doing more and more, which is just to do blind submissions and footnote blind submission and author blind submission. Oh yeah, um, and th you know that that's got that's got some appeal. Um, it also increases if we if we believe that vetting is useful, it. Um, and if we believe that there is some merit at all to a spectrum of perceived law review fanciness, um, in that, and if we think that more important or better, more rigorous articles should be in more widely read journals, that that potentially serves to um, to weaken that because that takes away a, a tool from editors if you believe that that's important. Another intervention is just more strict guidelines, right, for editors um, and instructions to authors, right, and more transparency in why you're including people, who they're there for, and perhaps requiring a recommending contribution statement the way that is exceptionally common in scientific research. In your research, did you find that there were any other discriminatory effects associated with this kind of heuristic, like, for example, in relation to women or minorities? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
uh, it turns out that acknowledgements skew uh, uh, very heavily male. Um, there are a disturbingly high number of acknowledgements footnotes that acknowledge only men uh, and close to zero acknowledgements footnotes that acknowledge only women. Uh, the distribution is, is heavily skewed uh, male. Um, and, you know, that's something else that I, I think we want to point out here. Like this, who gets, who gets asked to do, uh, to read papers may well be inequitable. We can't, we can't actually directly probe that, but we can certainly look at who gets thanked and who gets this type of kind of scholarly credit. Uh, and the answer is overwhelmingly, well, the answer is, uh, is unfairly, uh, and skewedly, uh, men. <laughs> Well, so okay, this is going to be a kind of a weird question, but I can't help but ask, if I want to get Harvard Law Review's attention, what should I do? Well, so the funny thing with your particular question is none of the things we've talked about right now will help you with Harvard Law Review because they actually do blind submission. Uh, and so they don't, they don't see the acknowledgement footnotes, at least uh, theoretically they don't. Uh, and so uh, none of the things that we talk about will uh, help you out there. Now, I can tell you that if you want to get Columbia Law Review's uh, attention uh, using at least the tools in our paper, then the thing that you'd want to do is uh, acknowledge uh, a bunch of work note, workshops at which hopefully you've presented. Uh, thank your research assistants for their support and name as many people that have commented on your paper as you can, especially uh, if they are well-known people at fancy law schools. If you can name a bunch of those people and say that you've presented at a bunch of workshops, uh, that sure seems like it might help your chances. Uh, at least that's what our data seem to suggest. Yeah, fortunately, we didn't really find anything that had an opposite hockey stick effect, right? like magic words to get you only placed in um, the most obscure journals. <laughs> Although some people might want that too. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> Maybe inclusion of the word Brian Fry does. I don't know. <laughs> well, so, okay. So like in closing, kind of big picture question, obviously I got to ask, A, where are you guys going with this research next? and B, what, if anything, do you think this tells us about the entire ecosystem as a whole? I mean, you know, is this just another reason that we should be rethinking what we're doing and why we're doing it? And what, if anything, do you think legal scholarship should look like in the future? Uh, so I'll take the first bit of that and <laughs> leave the second bit to Jonathan. Um what I really want to do with these data is use them to kind of look more deeply at the networks of scholarship and the relationships between scholars. I'm really curious as to kind of looking more in a network sense as to who acknowledges whom and, and how can we look at that to say, this is what scholarly communities look like within the legal academy. What sub communities are really insular and what communities interact across different subfields. What are the kind of relationships that potentially stay long term? Do people develop small groups where they all send their pieces around? And are those more likely to be things that are subject matter specific? Or are they just who you happen to be a fellow with if you were a fellow? Uh, I'm curious about how these can help us understand not just kind of the the law review submission process and the process of writing the article, but also the process of kind of how scholarship develops in the first place and, and who's talking to whom uh, in the legal academy. You know, I'm, I'm not such a huge skeptic as some people are of the um, law review process. So like this is not meant really to be a hit job on, on law reviews and student editorship um, because I, you know, I, I, contrary to what a lot of people so yeah, like I, I think it's a, a nice experience to kind of in, engage in this weird third-party way with scholarship as an editor um, and, and, and training and all that. And I, I think there's actually some aspects of legal scholarship that scientific scholarship could benefit from doing more directly, such as more direct involvement of students and not just under the board involvement of students. and more attention to, to footnotes 
and, um, and the relationship of footnotes to that. But a lot of what, what would be nice to see basically in, in legal scholarship is some breakdown of, of these barriers that are there. You know, even if these indicia are acting as, as uh, proxies for peer review or, and are improving papers, that doesn't mean it's equitable. And so going forward, um, it might be nice to see legal scholarship evolve to a point at which the exact journal is less important and the name is less important in the evaluation process. Now that's going to involve that's going to involve a lot of of um, a lot of reforms, right? You can't do that just by having more clarity in your footnotes. It would involve overhauling the shotgun style submission cycles for one thing to allow more substantive engagement with the scholarship. Um, and so, I don't know, you know, it'd be nice to get to somewhere where you, you can kind of keep some of the nice aspects of, of legal scholarship um, without all this entrenchment of existing um, haves versus have nots. Mm. Well, Nicholson, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the program today. It was a real pleasure having you on, and congratulations on this really excellent paper. I enjoyed it a ton, and I expect to be citing it in the future. Thanks again so much for having us. This was really a pleasure. Thank you. Another little friend for me.